Hello students, today this is what we are going to focus on in our photo key lesson. So to get started, I'm just logged into my photo key account and again you can just make sure that you're logged in by clicking on account and then just seeing if you're logged in. If not, you log in. And I'm going to create a new file. So new. And then up here, I'm just going to name this selection or something like that. Uh, I'm going to go with 1280 by 720 in pixels, 72 DPI is fine with a white background. We'll create that. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn a little bit more about the selection tools. The selection tools are the tools that you can use in PhotoP to isolate an area of a photo that you want to color in or edit in some way. And the reason they're handy is because when you have an area selected with what I refer to as marching ants, these little dashed areas, you can edit anything inside that area, but nothing outside that area. You notice I can't paint out here. I can only paint inside the area that has the selection. I'm going to get rid of that and just demonstrate the basic selection tools. And then we're going to make a little design that should help you with the first part of the first assignment. So your, uh, the, the tools we're going to be using here are the selection tool. There's a rectangle select, and there's also, if you right click or hold down left click, there is a rectangle select and an ellipse select. Now I notice that my, uh, my tracking isn't turned on here, so I'm just going to pause and make sure I turn on my, my mouse and keyboard tracking so that you can follow what I'm doing. So that's a little better. You should be able to see all the mouse and keyboard exercises I'm doing down here, and I usually try to save them as I'm doing them as well. So for the rectangular marquee tool, all you have to do is click and drag and it'll make a rectangular feature. And you'll notice that it fills in with marching ants afterward. If you want to draw a perfect square, you can just hold down the shift key while you're doing it and it'll make a perfect square. But it starts from the top left corner, moves down to the lower right. If you hold down the alt key while you're doing it, start your, start your selection and then hold down the alt key. And then what you should notice is that it goes out from the middle, not from the edges. So that's the alt key. There is an ellipse tool as well, and that's for circular or oval objects. Same rules apply if you press down the shift key when you are whoops, when you're drawing, start your start your rectangle, and then hold down shift and it or sorry, start your circle. Hold down shift and then now you notice it's a perfect circle. And the alt key works as well to go from the middle instead of the top left corner. And you can use both shift and alt at the same time so that you get a circle that goes out from the middle as opposed to out from the top left corner. Underneath that, we've got the polygonal la the lasso tool, the polygonal and the magnetic lasso tool. For this one, we're just gonna use lasso select, polygonal lasso select. The lasso select is just a freehand one so you can draw whatever you want setting there and that'll make a selection polygonal is basically straight lines but it does the same thing and magnetic you usually use to follow an object if you try to trace the edge I don't use it all that much even for that purpose so what we're going to do here is we're going to build a, uh, a little castle and I'm going to show you the concept of color stroke and color fill as well to help you through that first assignment All right, so starting with a blank screen again, making sure I'm on this background layer. It's the only layer we're gonna use, so we don't really need to do anything else over there. I'm gonna start and make the base of a castle just with a regular rectangle select. Just a sec here, I'm just bringing up something in my other page. All right, so we're gonna start with the base of the castle, which is just going to be a rectangle, something like that. And now we are going to add to our selection. So I can only edit inside this area right now, but I want to build something that looks more like a castle so that I can fill uh, you know, a more complex shape. And that's where we come to these tools up here, or these options for the tool. When you have uh, Unite selected, it means that whatever you, whatever you drag uh, as far as a selection box now, it will add it to the current selection. And the one right next to it is a Subtract, which means you will be able to cut things out of your current selection. So I want to build the second row of my castle right now. I'm going to use the Unite. And I'm just going to do something like this just to make a second level of the castle. And you'll notice that when I let go of the mouse, 
now I've got uh, uh, this area added as well. You can always test just by grabbing the brush tool and seeing you know, what you're selecting and what you're not selecting. I'm going to add a third level onto it at the top. This doesn't have to be perfect. You're just, you're just sort of giving me an idea that you understand how to use these tools. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make little crenellations at the top to sort of look like a castle. So I'm going to switch over now from Unite to Subtract. And then I'm just going to start outside my selection, drag into my selection, and make these little sort of castle-shaped things so my archers can shoot arrows out, out there. So I, I basically subtracted these little rectangular portions here from the, from the bigger picture. Okay, now I'm going to uh, make a little flagpole. So I want to stay with Unite, and then I'm just going to draw a narrow flagpole straight up into the sky, and it adds that to my selection as well. Again, you'll notice that I can paint into it, but nowhere else. I want to make a little flag here. I'm going to make a triangular little flag or pennant, so the rectangular tool is not going to work very well for me. I'm going to switch down to the polygonal lasso tool because I want it to have uh, you know triangular features, so it's going to be straight lines. So I'll go with polygonal, and I'll make sure that I'm on Unite. Then I'm just going to start inside this area, click once, click twice, click three times, and then back to the beginning. If you accidentally miss on one of your one of your little anchor points here, you can hit the backspace key, and it'll go back one of your clicks for every uh, for every time you hit the backspace key. So I'm just going to go out here, and then make a little flag, and then go back down to the bottom. If you double click anywhere. Um, it'll uh, it'll go back to the first point. So I can be just about right here as long as it's a straight line to my first point. I double click, it'll add it. So now you'll notice I've got this little triangular feature. Okay, now let's flip back up and let's make a uh, let's make a little uh, uh, circular window here. So I'm going to go instead of the rectangle select, I'm going to go to ellipse select, and I'm going to hold down. I'm going to start my circle right about there. And then I'm going to hold down both Shift and Alt, so I make it a perfect circle and go up from the middle. So I'll make a little porthole there. Maybe I'll make another one right beside it. Then I'm going to make a cannon hole with a free, with the uh, free lasso tools. So if I go over here to the lasso tools, I'm going to go with lasso select, which is the freehand one. Make sure again that I'm on unite. And then I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna draw some sort of random. Oops, I don't want unite. I want subtract because I want to cut the hole out. So I'm sorry. I want to do a somewhat random cannonball hole into my uh, into my selection. So if you, if I just, you know, use the paintbrush, you can see what's selected and what's not selected. Control Z to get out of those. Remember, Control Z goes backwards. Control Shift Z, I believe, goes uh, forwards. So now, what I want to do is I want to color my uh, color my castle, and I only want to color the areas that are selected, which is basically already done for me. Now we have to look at the concept of a fill and a stroke. A stroke is just basically a border around your selection area, and you can do it in any color, or you can do it in any thickness. And the way that you access that is you go to the Edit menu, and then you'll notice Fill and Stroke here. So I'm going to start with the stroke, and then in here, these are your stroke options. I'll keep it at three pixels. I should be able to see that. This is outside, just starting on the outside of the dotted lines. This is starting from the inside of the dotted lines, and this is started from the center. It doesn't really matter for this one. I'll just keep it at, oops, I'll keep it at outside. Don't worry about blend mode. Opacity should be 100. And for your first assignment, I think I've asked for this to be in some shade of red. And then you just hit OK and OK. And you'll notice now that I have a red border around all of those selection dots. Now I want to fill inside that red border, and that's going to be with the fill tool. So there's two options here. If you go to the fill tool, it'll give you the options of foreground, background, custom, and some other stuff. I'm just going to stick with custom because I'm going to want to put a blue in there just to demonstrate it. So I'll put a blue in, and you'll notice that you can still see the red stroke, but there's also a blue fill. For your assignment, I ask you to use what's known as a gradient. A gradient is just a subtle change from one color to another. You can have more than two colors in a gradient. You can have as many as you want, make a rainbow sort of feature. But for now, we're just going to use a, a simple blue to black gradient. So I'm going to actually uh, Control-Z my fill there, and I'm going to show you where the gradient tool is. So the gradient tool is down here on your main menu. 
And when you click on it, it gives you some options up here. What we want is a linear gradient. The rest of these should just be in default. And then you can click on this area to edit your colors. All right, so these top ones just shift the, uh, uh, shift the uh, transition from the blue to the black. But for this one, I just want to keep them on the outside. If you want to add another color in the middle, you notice it starts at blue and goes to black. If you want to add another color, you can just click anywhere down here. You can add as many colors as you want. And you can edit any of those colors just by selecting it and then going down here to your color and then picking whatever you want. So now you notice I've got that color in there. You can get rid of them just by clicking on them and dragging them out, which I will do now because I just want a blue and black. So I've already got my blue selected and obviously my black selected. I can make it whatever I want, but I ask for black. And then you can play with this to show where the gradient is changing. So this is really like the center of the gradient, sort of equal blue and equal black. So you just drag that back to where you think it, it looks good. Then you hit OK, and now you got one more step. It looks like nothing happened because nothing happened. However, if you click and drag, this is where your blue is going to start. And if you hold down Shift, by the way, you make sure it's a straight line. You can make sure it's a horizontal line or a vertical line. I want it to be horizontal, so I'm just going to drag this all the way to the other end let go, and you'll notice that my blue starts here, my black starts where I end it. And that is uh, how you do basically the first part of that first assignment. Make sure at the end of every selection, whenever you're done with the marching ants and you want to sort of go back and maybe do something else to the picture, maybe I want to add a cloud or something, you hit Control D, and that gets rid of the marching ants, and now you can color anywhere in your picture. Okay, so just in case I had this built and maybe I wanted to make like a little cloud or something like that, in a different color, now I can go back and I can do, uh, you know, different things with it. You know, I could take my paintbrush and, and maybe I'll make a nice little gray storm cloud or something like that. So I can clear freezing in here. There we go. So maybe I'll just change this into like a gray or something like that. And then I'll just color in my cloud. I could have used fill. And again, when you're using the brush tool, that you can use these square brackets to make your brush bigger or smaller. That's the shortcut and generally what you want to do. Now I'll hit Control D. And you'll notice that I've got everything in this one layer. So that's how you use the selection tools to isolate areas that you can, that you can draw on. The next thing that I want to do is demonstrate for you how you can use selection tools in order to get rid of um, or, or modify other elements in a drawing. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up uh, a different drawing. So I'm going to go to open, and this should be in your Photoshop practice. I'll call it Photo P when I actually put these files up. Photoshop practice. So there should be a tomato in there. So I'll open that up. Now I've got this tomato, and I've got it on my background layer. First thing I should always do is Control J to make a copy of whatever it is that you've got selected. In this case, the entire drawing, because I haven't put out any selection ants yet. And then I'm going to lock the background okay, and, and hide it. And this one, I'm just going to double click on the name. I'm going to call it tomato, just so I'm always aware of what's on each layer. We have to understand the difference between uh, white and nothing. White is a color. Okay, So if I were to place this image or drag it to another, uh, to another drawing, you would notice a white border around it. So even though it looks like it might be transparent, it's not. You can always drag what you have selected to another, uh, to another file using these tabs up top. I've got actually got two things open at once. So if I click and hold and drag, still holding, still holding, now I drag down, still holding, and now I drop, you'll notice that I can't see the blue and black behind the tomato. Okay, I can see white because I've got a border. Maybe my goal is to cut this tomato out and to put it here so that I just see tomato and not this, uh, not this white border around it. So in order to do that, we essentially have to cut this out of this drawing and make sure that the background is all transparent as well as, uh, or instead of white. There are several ways to do this, and this is a really, really core uh, photo P. Uh, exercise. You're going to have to do this for all sorts of Im image editing. So this is a skill that you're really going to need to practice, and you're going to get a lot of practice uh, in the assignments and in the tutorials. So there's a bunch of different ways to cut things out. If I were just to take the erase tool and start erasing, oops, make sure I'm on my tomato layer, you'll notice that I get these little gray and white 
uh, checkerboard behind whatever it is I erased. Now that's actually how PhotoKey represents something being transparent. So if I were to, you know, very carefully with my erase tool, trace around the tomato and then move my layer over to this, now you'll notice that I should be able to see that area that I erased is now transparent and I can see behind it. In my layer stack, whatever's at the top is the thing that's closest to your eyes. So the tomato's on top of the background, which means I can see through the uh, transparency into the background to see those background features. Clearly that's not enough, that's not done, so we need to go the rest of the way. Now using the eraser tool is, uh, it, 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 you know, sometimes it's necessary for little sections, but it's definitely not the best way to, to do this. The best way to, uh, to cut an object out or to isolate a specific object inside of a drawing or a file is to, uh, is to use either the magic wand tool or, generally speaking, the polygonal lasso tools are the ones I use most often. But there's also some other options that we'll get into a little bit later. Using the magic wand tool, basically the magic wand tool just takes a sample of the color of wherever you click and then selects it. There's a tolerance bar and that just tells you how tolerant it is to selecting other colors. So if your tolerance is really high, like 90, wherever I click, let's say I click inside the tomato, it's going to grab the red I clicked as well as a bunch of other reds that are kind of close to it. So if I dial that up a little bit to say 99 and I click again, okay, now you'll notice it's selected more. It's just not selecting these white areas and a bit at the bottom, but it's selected more of the tomato. If I turn my tolerance way down to say 2 and then I click, sorry I'm on add right now, I need to replace. Now you'll notice it only selects a very narrow band of red, so it's less tolerant to other colors. This is not particularly useful for me trying to select a tomato. So one of the best ways to select an object that's on a high contrast background is to use the magic wand tool. Instead of me trying to select the tomato and sort of, uh, you know, play with my tolerance until I grab every part of the tomato, it's much easier for me to just click on the background. I'm gonna dial my tolerance back to 32. That's sort of the standard level. Now, when I click on the white, you'll notice that it selects all the white because the white is a very consistent color and it's got a very high contrast on the edge where it goes into the red. PhotoKey had no difficulty selecting all of the white. Now, the only things it didn't select are the tomato, which is a goal as well as this shadowed area at the bottom. So when I, when I paint right now, you can see what I've got selected. I've got the white selected, but I don't have, it's easier to see with black. I've got the white selected, but I don't have this, this shadow selected, and I don't have that little chunk. There's a little chunk right in the middle of the, uh, of the tomato that's white, so I thought I should grab that as well. So it's great, but it's not quite perfect. Well, I have to adapt it a little bit. I'm just gonna control Z back a little bit, and I wanna demonstrate the difference in your magic wand tool between um, contiguous and having that turned off. Contiguous means it'll grab all the white on the that, that's connected on the outside, but it'll also go inside other objects and it'll grab white in there too. So when I, when I do the uh, non-contiguous, it's going to select everything outside as well as everything inside. If I turn contiguous on, now it's only going to select the things that are connected. So it's only going to connect all the white on the outside that's connected and you see that this is no longer selected. So you can play with that, turn it on and off, depending on, on uh, what you want to do. So this looks pretty good. I've got a lot of white selected. It looks like it's the marching answer around the outside of my tomato. Okay. But I still have to play with this shadow part a bit because I don't want the shadow to come with me. I just want the tomato. Now we're at a point where we are going to zoom in nice and close and we're going to use our skills to and a couple different tools in order to cut that part out of my selection, or in this case, add it into our selection. You always got to be aware of what you've got selected. Right now, I have the white selected. You always test just by using the paintbrush, and you can see, okay, I've got the white part selected. I don't have the tomato, and I don't have the shadow. I want to get rid of the shadow first. So how am I going to do that? Well, there's a bunch of different ways. The tedious but accurate way is to get in really close to your edge, like, so you can see pixels, basically. And then you can use the polygonal lasso tool and then just click carefully around the outside. Because I have the white selected, I would like to add this shadow to the white because I'm gonna get rid of the white at the very end. All right, so I'm gonna go in nice and close and I'm gonna make sure that I've got Unite turned on because I wanna add the gray area to the white area. Then you basically just click, 
somewhere near the edge of the tomato, and you make your way around the tomato. Now, you are doing this with straight lines, which is why we zoom in so far. You don't want to see jagged straight lines in your final product. Okay, so I'm going just a little bit inside the tomato. If I accidentally mess up, remember to hit the backspace key. Okay, so I'm just going to try and keep this as close to the outside, and I'm not going to do lines that are too long because I don't want it to look jagged at the end. So I'm just going to kind of, as carefully as I can, trace around this object, clicking every so often. Now this is the tedious part, and this is just part of Photoshop work. You have to get in close. It's all about detail management and zooming in close. Now I got to the end of my screen here. If you just kind of mouse off the edge of the screen, it'll, it'll, it'll pan the document for you, or you can hold down the space bar and click and drag, and that'll turn it into the hand, and you're still working with your tool. You see it didn't change the tool. I'm still making my selection using the polygonal lasso tool. Three quarters of the way done. Just keep clicking, keep clicking. When you zoom out, all of these little sharp edges from the points that I'm clicking, they won't be as noticeable. If you aren't zoomed in, they will be noticeable and look ragged and gross. All right, so now I am at the end of the tomato. I'm just going to go a little bit outside the tomato. And this is where you should zoom out just by spinning while holding Alt. And now I don't have to be as exact. The exact part needed to be the edge of the tomato. Now all I have to do is surround the rest of the shadow. So I'm just going to click anywhere outside the shadow, get around to the beginning, and as long as I've got a straight line between my last point and my first point, I can just double click. And you'll notice, as soon as I did that, it added all of that area that I had surrounded to the existing white selection. So now I should have just white selected. At this point, it becomes easy to get rid of it because all I have to do is hit the delete key, which is basically erase all. It erases the background. So now I'm in a position where I can move the tomato over and I won't see any of the white. It should just see the tomato. But I don't have the tomato selected right now. I've got the white selected. So if I try to move it, look what I'm moving. Oh, and it, it, I guess it automatically went to the, to the tomato because I've got auto select on. In any case, I only have white selected, uh, the white area selected right now or what was formerly white. And you can tell again just by painting a brush. I don't have the tomato selected. I can't do anything to the tomato. I can only do things to this area that I had selected. This is where using inverse is very important. Sometimes it's easier to select what you don't want than it is to select what you do want. I selected what I didn't want, the white, because it was a high contrast. Now I can use an inverse tool to flip it. So now everything that wasn't selected before will be selected now. And that is up here in the select menu. If you go to select, you'll notice that there is inverse. And I usually use the shortcut key, which is Shift, Control, and I at the same time. So as soon as I hit inverse, you'll notice my marching ants from the outside of the drawing disappear. And that's because the, the uh, part of the image I have selected right now is just the tomato. So using that inverse flipped it. So instead of having all the white selected, now I've got the tomato selected. Again, I could just use the brush tool to show you that. Okay, Can't draw out here, can draw in there. So do that. Sometimes it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort to select something. So you might want to save that selection so you can go back to it in the future. If you go up to the select menu again, you'll notice that there is a save selection feature. So if you click save selection, it doesn't look like it did anything, but if you go to channels, I probably told you to turn that off later, uh, earlier, but you do need it actually, so make sure that's turned on. <laughs> if you go to channels, now you'll see something called alpha one, and alpha one is basically just a cutout of your, of your tomato. This uh, pink color or light red on the outside is just, is just showing you the outside. If I turn off the other colors of the tomato, you can see that now it is, uh, it's in a position where you can see the cutout of the tomato. And in order to use that again, I'm going to hit Control D to deselect. So if I go back to my actual image, uh, just turning RGB back on, okay, and turning the alpha or hiding the alpha, You'll notice I don't have my marching ants anymore. I, I hit Control D to deselect. But what if I want to? What if I want to select the app, uh, the tomato again? I don't want to have to go to that work to doing it again. So this is where you can use that saved selection. So the saved selection. If I go to the channels again and I go to Alpha, oops, not blue, Alpha. Make sure I'm on the Alpha layer, and then I do selection. Okay, so that's down here. It goes right back to the selection that you had before. So that's a way you can save. Uh, the selection cutouts that you've done on more complex objects. And they'll all, you can have as many as you want in here. It'll just keep stacking up after that alpha one. 
Okay, I don't need that anymore, so I, you know, I'm not going to delete it, but I'm just going to hide it. Okay, and I'm going to go back to my layers. I'm going to make sure I'm on my tomato layer. I can deselect at this point because um, there's no more white; it's all transparent. And so I'm going to hit the Control D key, and that deselects, gets rid of your marching ants. Now I'm in a position where I can go to my Move tool. I can drag my tomato back to my castle, and then I can resize it within the castle, or I can rotate it. I can do whatever I want. Hit enter or the check mark up here and you will note that my tomato is cut out and it is in my, uh, it's inside of my castle and I don't see any of that formerly white area, I only see the tomato. Tomato's on top of the background so I can see it first, it's closest to my eyes. If I were to shift these two around, which I just did, now you'll notice that the tomato is hidden because there's white on the background, then there's also blue and red on the background, those are all on the same. So I know my, my tomato is there but I can't see it. If I were to go to my background layer, it's currently locked, but I'll unlock it, and just erase a bit of the background here. Okay. Now I go back to my tomato layer, and I get my move tool, and I move it. Whoops, I'll move my tomato, not my background. Keep grabbing the background. That's because the auto selects turned on. I'll just turn that off for a second. Now can you see it hiding there? Okay. But in this case, I wanted it on the, above the background layer so that you could see it, so I'll just bring it there. And uh, you know what, I'll just control Z to get my white back there instead of painting it again. Control Z, control Z, control Z, get my tomato back on top. Okay, when you are bringing things from one object to another, the, there might be a difference in the quality of the two images or the resolution of the two images. And you might get sort of a, you know, a pixelated back or a pixelated edge around one of your images. You always want to try to grab images that are as high quality as you can. And remember, you can always make an, an image smaller without losing any quality, but you can't make an image bigger without losing quality. So that's something you've got to be aware of when you're working with multiple images. If you want to mitigate this edge somewhat, if you want to make it look a little bit smoother, you can use what's known as a feather. So I'm just going to delete this tomato because I noticed there was kind of a hard pixely edge on it. I'm going to go back into this drawing and I'm going to select just the tomato again. So if I'm on the tomato layer, I'm going to go to channels and just get my selection back. So I go to alpha and then I go to select. So now I've got my tomatoes selected again. Now I can hide my alpha, go back to layers. Now I'm at a point where you can see my marching ants around the tomato again. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to feather the edge a little bit. It's almost like taking a bit of a spray paint eraser and just softening the edge. And the easiest way to do that is to go up to the select menu. And then in here, there's something called modify. And then in modify, there is something called feather. So if you go to feather, it'll ask you how many pixels do you want to feather? And you, you might have to play with this a little bit. So I'm going to feather at three pixels right now. I'm going to see how that looks. So I'm going to click OK. And what that's going to do is it's going to move my marching ants in just a little bit. It might not have been that noticeable, but when you drag the tomato again, you might notice that there is a little edge left behind. So it's not letting me move it for some reason. Come on. Not sure what's going on there. My uh, Photoshop seems to be frozen here, or my photo key. So I might have to pause here. I think my browser is just kind of crashing right now. So I'll just pause and make sure. All right, browser crash averted, and I seem to be back. That'll happen every once in a while. Actually, that's a probably a good reminder that um, you should be saving fairly often, right? And saving it as a PSD, which is Photoshop file, so that retains all your layers and all the all the stuff you've done. So I'm, I'm just gonna put this on my desktop right now, call it tomato.psd, save it. And then every once in a while, I'm just gonna hit Control S just to save it again, just in case your browser crashes. Uh, but in any case, I've got, uh, I've got it back again. So now I can grab my tomato again, I can bring it up to this, the other layer, and I can place it here. Oh, what happened there? It looks like I accidentally grabbed, uh, oh, for, had inverse on for some reason. There we go, wanna grab the tomato, not the selection. There we go. Okay, so now I've brought my tomato in. I can still see this like ragged and white edge there. So I might want to feather a bit more. So I'm just going to control Z that, go back to my tomato, select, modify, feather, and I'll do another three pixels. So now, now when I drag it, you can see what it's leaving behind. That's the stuff it's feathered out. So now I bring it in and I resize it. Rotate it again if I want. Hit enter. 
Now when I zoom in, it should be a slightly softer edge. Okay, you see there's a bit more of a fade between the tomato and this. Now, in, the reality is that the tomato image is much too small for the canvas that I made. The resolution and size of the canvas that I made is, you'll notice that's about uh, you know, 18 inches or, or so. And, uh, and it's, it was uh, 72 DPI, I believe. So it looks fine when you're, when you're you know, sort of out at full, full zoom. And that's at 94%. So you always treat 100% as what it should look like in reality. So there's 102%. It looks pretty good, actually. I don't notice any pixelation on the edges. I only notice it when I zoom in farther than I should. And you zoom in far enough on any raster image, you're going to see pixels. That's what a raster image is. So I could, I could probably leave it like that. I'm probably comfortable with that. Or if I still wanted to feather it a little bit more, I could go right back, Control z to go back there. And I can add even more to my selection. So I, you know, I'll feather it a ridiculous amount this time, and you'll see, you'll see what is actually happening. So you see how that edge is now really kind of out there. Now, if I go and drag my tomato, look how much I've left behind, right? So this is going to look kind of silly. I just wanted to demonstrate what a, you know, what what a very highly feathered image looks like. So now it looks pretty gross, almost like a ghost tomato, but it's feathered. Okay, now uh, one more tool here. I'm going to go back, way back, way back to the beginning. And in fact, I might just junk this tomato layer, go back to my original, and, uh, and create a, a completely new layer. So I'll Control D to get rid of my marching ants, Control J to make a new layer. Uh, maybe I'll call this tomato 2, because I want to show you one more tool that's really useful for cutting objects out. All right, so I'm going to uh, hide the background and work with the tomato I guess, 2 layer. And I'm going to try to do the same thing. I want to cut the tomato out, but I'm going to use a slightly different tool that's a little bit better for curves, but it is a little bit more, uh, it's a little trickier to do. So I'm going to start the same way I started before. I'm going to take my magic wand, I'm going to click the background, and the white, and then I'm going to work with the shadow down here. So if I go in here, okay, I just want to get it so that I can see both edges of the tomato. I don't have to zoom in quite as far for this one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use something called the pen tool in order to select the rounded area of the tomato. Now this one takes a little bit more practice, but once you learn how to do it, you'll use it for curves way more often because you can get, instead of having to use a bunch of little straight lines, you can do it in two clicks and a couple of drags. The pen tool is not the same as the pencil tool. The pencil tool is under the brush and it's just for drawing things. The pen tool is actually for creating shapes that have unique curves in them. And you can make curves perfectly, you can replicate curves perfectly. We're going to work a lot more with this in the next unit on vector-based graphics, but for now, we're just going to use it to get rid of this shadow. Up here, you'll notice it's set to shape, and we've got a fill and a stroke. I want to change that to path. Path just means that it's we're going to be able to see the, the, the curve we drew, but it's not actually going to fill it with any color or anything like that. And I also want to set this to uh, subtract because, oh no, wait a minute, let me think about that. No, I have the white selected, and I want to add this to the selection, so that should be unite. Unite is the add. So I want this on selection and I want it on path and then I just want to click somewhere on the outside edge of the tomato. And by the way, if you if you prefer, oh, never mind. I thought there was an option for turning it into a crosshair, but that's just in Photoshop. Um, all right, so I'm just going to click here, make sure I have the pen tool turned on. And then the, you might see a little blue dot there. That's the start of my path. And this here is going to be the end of my path. And what I'm gonna do before I click is I'm gonna click and drag a little bit and you'll notice a curve start to appear. So I'm gonna click and drag a bit, okay? Now I'm gonna let go and I have my starting point, I have my ending point, and then I have these little handles. I'll come back to the handles later. Every time I click, it's gonna go from the last point I clicked to a new point. Now I wanna surround this shadow. So I'm going to go out here, I'm going to click, and you notice there's a curve there, don't worry about that for now. All you have to do is make sure that you're outside of the shadow, just like we did with the other tool. Then I'll go back to the beginning, and I have this entire area surrounded. It looks like it's a blue line, but the blue line is just representing a path. At this point, what I want to do is I want to manipulate this particular curve so that it perfectly matches the bottom of the tomato. And I could do it exactly, and I won't have all those sort of little straight line segments. So now I should probably zoom in just a little bit, because I, I need to be able to click this dot, this blue dot. And you have to hold down shift while you're doing it. OK, 
Okay, so, or sorry, control. Make sure you're holding down control key and then click. And then when you do that, it allows you to move this point because chances are you might have missed it a little bit. So if you missed a little bit, you can zoom in onto that intersection, hold down control, grab that point, and you can place it perfectly where you want. And then you can go to the other side and do the same thing. Okay, so this is the second point here, control. And this one was pretty good. I just want to make sure it's right on the edge of the tomato so that when I make my curve, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll match. Okay, now we're gonna go play with these handles a little bit. You'll notice there's a handle on the bottom and there's a handle way up here on the top. Again, hold down control. That allows you to select any of these points. When you hold down control, it'll let you grab this handle and just click and drag. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna be able to modify this curve. And just by pulling this handle around, you will be able to make it so that you select the curve perfectly. And you notice how much nicer that bend is. Um, if I zoom in, looks really good on this side. If I zoom in, I'd rather, I'd rather err a bit on the side of caution, which means I don't want to cut any white out. So I might grab my control and, and just move that point just inside the tomato. So I'm not accidentally grabbing white. It's okay if I leave a little bit of the tomato on the outside. Um, I notice I got a little white down there. I'll fix that, but I'll do the same thing with this point, holding control. And I'll just drag it a little bit inside the tomato, just barely. Okay, now I'll zoom back out. And then I'll just play with this curve a bit more, just so I'm very comfortable at the bottom. So holding control, playing with his hand a little bit, moving it back and forth, up and down. And it looks like that's pretty good right there. So now you'll see, ignore the, ignore the lines on the handles. The lines on the handles are just to help you make that curve. So it doesn't matter how far outside the selection area I am, as long as this curve matches perfectly, I've got a good path. These are called anchor points or nodes, and the line is called a path. So the entire thing is just a series of paths. But the, the reason we used it is, again, because of that nice curve that we can make. Now you just need to go to Selection and make sure you've got Unite turned on. Okay, so make sure you've got Unite turned on, and then click OK, and it has added that area to our selection. So you, again, we'll have all the white and all the shadows selected now, which means I can hit the Delete key again and get rid of all the white background and go to the move tool and move my tomato just like I did before. So it's just a, an alternative way of selecting things, a way that is easier to use with curves. That takes care of all of the, uh, that takes care of all the selection tools and we're just gonna work and practice on those through the next couple of assignments to make sure that we really dial those skills in because they're gonna be useful for, full for all of the, uh, all of the future uh, photo key assignments that you do. There's just a couple more things that I want to go into um, in this tutorial lesson, just a couple of minor uh, other tools you can use. I'm just going to delete this tomato for now. Okay. Now I'm going to show you the text tool. Text tool is very easy to use. You just take the T, and you can click and drag the text box, and then you can type whatever you want, and it will show up. Okay, so now this is quite pixelated because my drawing is, is uh, or my canvas is not very big. Maybe it might be better to do it on this layer here. So I'll just click text. Okay, click. Now you can, it, now it's a separate layer. You can see it over here. You can move it. You can do whatever you want to it. You can resize it. You can rotate it. You can do whatever you want to the text or you can work within any other menu. So I could add a border to this, a stroke to this, or I can also manipulate text size and font and things. So if we go over here to character, you'll notice that you can change the font to whatever you want. So there's a whole bunch of fonts installed on your computer and you just, you know, you pick the one that, that you think works best for you. And then you can also, you can also modify certain things in here as tracking, we've learned, letting. Um, you can manipulate the size of the text, the height. You can manipulate the width of the text, the baseline width. You can make it bold and italicized. Okay, you can change the color. And you can also do things like gradients and, uh, and uh, strokes of fill. So if I hit OK here, um, for my color, maybe I'll go to my gradient fill. And oops. Sorry, uh, if you're going to do a gradient, you have to do a, what's known as a rasterization. But text it deep by default comes out as basically just lines and shapes. If you want to turn it into pixels, you can just right click on it and then you can go to rasterize. So you can rasterize that layer. And then once your layer is rasterized, you can, oops, once your layer is rasterized, I'll lock the other layer here. Then you can, you, 
can do gradients on that layer. But I want to do, uh, say, gradient inside the text. I would want to grab my magic wand tool and click on that green and also turn contiguous on. So it grabs the other green letters as well. And then because only the green letters are selected, if I go back to my gradient tool and I do a gradient, because I had just the letters selected, now it does a text gradient in there. And you can do things like stroke too. So I could fill it with a certain color or I could go to stroke and maybe I get a green stroke on the outside, eight pixels. There you go. So you can do pretty much whatever you want to your text. The other thing that's handy is there's an effects menu at the bottom. We'll go into this in a bit more detail, but um, you can do stroke and um, you know all sorts of shadows and things like that in here. Typically, I would add my stroke in here. You can bevel it or emboss it so it looks like it's sort of cut into uh, cut oops, cut into the object. Show my move tool here behind it. Um, so if you were you know if you were making something that was like sort of had a leather look or something like that, um, you could sort of make it look like the text is cut into it a bit. So lighter gradient. Sorry, maybe too many white pieces here. Ugly pink. Just so it's easier to see. Um, so you can add any of these effects down here with the EFF menu. You can emboss it. There's all sorts of effects. And uh, it's supposed to sort of look like it's rounded edges and kind of cut in there. And uh, so as an inner bevel, that's an emboss. Okay, and I'll have to control D to look, you know. So it adds that sort of embossed look into it. Uh, you can also add things like a uh, like a drop shadow I use quite often. So there's a drop shadow. You can see it now behind the text. You can change the opacity of it. So it's, you know, it's thicker or thinner. You can change how far away it is from the text. You can also change the angle that it's at. So, you know, which way the light's kind of shining on it. And uh, there's all sorts of things you can play around in there. Again, there, there's the stroke right there. So I've got an inner stroke for, for red. So you can play around with that, but that's just a text tool. And then after you rasterize the text, you can do all sorts of different things with it. Okay, I think that takes care of a bunch of different skills and we'll have a few more of these, but uh, that should get you well on your way to completing the, uh, the first little bit of that uh, uh, fundamental image manipulation skills test number one.